Welcome into the Dad Verb Podcast, where we chat about parenting from the lens of a dad. My name's Andrew, and I'm joined by Ben Brown and Andrew Saunders. On this episode, we're going to be chatting about facts and stats for a stronger marriage. Uh, but before we kick that off, we always got to do our sick check. And I'm just going to go ahead and kick it off uh, yet again. We are sick. We are sick. Family is sick. It's just we're in the middle of it. Uh, I It's been so bad. I've actually had a very bad week. I had uh, a full-on stomach virus. Um, and then I, and I was like literally down. Like It's one of those stomach viruses where you can't like you can't even watch TV. It's like not good. It's like not fun. <laughs> So it's it like you can't fake it, man. So I was like down for the count, the guilt of not being able to like take care of the kids. I don't know. It's just sucked. I think we're finally on the up and up, but like I've, I've got like lingering little issues of like heartburn and like I still like can't eat like I don't know certain foods without just getting like an upset stomach with a ton of gas. So I think I, I don't know. I would I'm rather I would rather have anything other than a stomach virus like it's pretty honestly bad. everything i think i honestly yeah. think i might rather have like a broken bone yeah. than a stomach virus <laughs> dude i mean because like stomach viruses are so brutal i've actually never broken a bone uh not knock on wood knock on wood i, I don't want you to have but like i haven't so i don't know what that feels like but i can tell you the stomach great. thing has really sucked it stomach was really virus, i hate stomach viruses more it's it's uh, more yeah. the idea of throwing up that like really bothers me yeah uh I, that's it's just uh it's such a i hate it so much i, I hate have it so much i actually do have a fear of throwing up i got thrown up on when i was in third grade um in, in my elementary school a kid like we were all in the lunch room and lunch room and like a kid like turned around and just puked on me all over my back and i guess it's just like <laughs> stuck with me uh as just like this i don't know Scarred but, you forever yeah and then like every day like my son comes home from school which is like this kid threw up that kid threw up i think his teacher has been out of school this this week because she has a stomach bug. There's something mm -hmm. just ripping through our, our community. But ay, ay, ay. anyway, I digress. What about you guys? How's your health? How's your health, Andrew? I'm, I'm going back with the stop ruining it. I, I'm holding the ship here at still you. not sick. And for the record, <laughs> right, it's not like I keep my kids in a jar and they don't interact no. with anybody, right? Yeah. Like, uh, this weekend, so this Saturday, we are going to spend, we're doing family Thanksgiving. There will be 15 kids between the ages of like eighth grade and I think mm. my youngest at eight, nine months is going to be the youngest. So uh -huh. if they're going to get a daycare disease, it will be at this Duh. event. There you go. And there you Duh. go. Odds are against you, man. Duh. Yeah, that's what you guys Duh. are telling me. But if I come back, I'll be like, they were fine. <laughs> I'm going with genetics wins on this one. Like, <laughs> <laughs> do you do you get sick in general? Are you like, have you passed that gene down to your kids? I, I you, for the just, most you... part, do not get sick. Um, my mother used to say she always knew if I was faking getting sick. Because I, if I was really sick, I was vomiting. Um, yeah. If I yeah. wasn't, if mm. I wasn't vomiting, I wasn't actually sick. Now that being said, yeah, I spent a lot of time in hospitals as an infant because I was chronically dehydrated and anemic, and like I was fed the brat diet so much when I was little that I hate, I can't eat bananas to this day. I, I don't even so, like apples. So you sauce. got all your sickness yeah. out of the way. Like early. I burned through it in the first four or five Dude, years. Right. And I had Let's, I don't talk about brat <laughs> diet. All I hear about kids is brat diet. I feel like this all is when your babies because a lot of listeners here are, are, are dads of little babies. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, multiple times every year you're gonna get your kid on the brat diet. Yeah. Loose stool. The pediatrician's are talking about um, anyway. <laughs> it's, hey, ben, what, what's going on with you? Are you healthier? Why are you upset about this? Uh, <laughs> Kids are kids are actually healthy this week. Um, so for we, you, we thought we were going to have a bout with pink eye since there was a, a baby in my daughter's daycare that had yeah. pink eye, but we managed to avoid it. Uh, so fingers crossed, we're doing pretty well. Nice. Um, hopefully, we've got family coming into town for for Thanksgiving. You know, coming up here in a little bit, and hopefully everybody stays healthy before then. That's the big goal. But you know, we'll take what we can get. We're healthy this week. Fingers crossed, guys. Well, with that said, our ch our sick check out of the way. Uh, let's dive into uh, our segment here. The bulk of the episode is going to be talking about facts and stats for a stronger marriage. We've uh, kind of grazed over this a couple of times. Uh, personally, uh, this is actually something a, a couple 
guy friends of mine that we've been um, sitting around. Uh, uh, we've got like solo stoves going on in each of our homes. And like last Saturday, the week before, we've just been chatting about actually kind of this topic. Uh, one, we're actually really fortunate, we're really blessed to, to all have wives that we love, um, that we're really happy. We're all in strong marriages. Uh, and we were just talking about some like tips and things that we've heard on Instagram. Uh, a few of us follow like these sex therapists, for example, um, mm -hmm. just for stronger marriages in that, in that, um, uh, you know, world. And, and the one kind of thing that I've latched onto lately, I'll get into in a little bit, but I, and I, I don't want to dive off that too hard yet. So I guess maybe I'll, I'll, Maybe we'll start with Ben, and then we'll and the might we'll migrate to Andrew here. But you know, especially with kids early on, maintaining that that strong marriage, the foundation of a family mm -hmm. can 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 get really tumultuous and tough in the early years of parenthood. Kids really shake the tree a lot, but that marriage is the firm foundation. We've talked about that in the past. So, what are some tips and tricks uh, and and facts about? stronger maintaining a strong marriage for you guys ben well, kick yeah. it off for us yeah so i think um first of all one thing to to kind of set the context and and think about it this way right no matter how strong somebody's marriage looks from the outside nobody's marriage is perfect right no. no matter how much you thought your parents were in love or how much your you know your best friend's marriage seems to be absolutely picture perfect Everybody has their issues. We're all going to struggle with something. And that's especially true when it comes to having kids. Um, having kids fundamentally changes both of your perspectives, your priorities, the way you communicate, the time you have to communicate and to invest in each other. And so you're going to have to effectively relearn your partner, right? Relearn their wants, their needs, their, their way they communicate, the way they deal with uh, tough situations. And so one of the big things that I think is really important for people to understand and to work through, and this is where you see a lot of breakdown is like effective communication. Um, I know like my wife and I definitely struggle with this early on in our relationship. And then we struggled with it again uh, when we had our first child and we continue to struggle with it. Right. Because you get in these situations where you're either feeling a lot, there's a lot happening and you don't necessarily know how to talk about that talk about those emotions, talk about those feelings, say, I'm either, you know, not at 100%. And so you really have to find new tools and ways to navigate. And so one of the things we we're actually just talking about tonight is like, when it comes to discipline and stress, like we we're having a really stressful bedtime with our toddler. And I was just starting to lose it. And I, you know, kind of was snapping at him and was just trying to get him to go to sleep. And I finally was just like, dude, he was making all these crazy demands. And I was like, dude, lay down here's your blankets. Like, and she kind of yeah. looked at me like, you know, he's, he's upset. And I was like, and I, the words came out of my mouth. They said, I don't care what he wants. He needs to go to sleep. And I was like, in my mind, trying to set a boundary, but from the outside, I'm obviously like, I'm overreacting towards a three-year-old at that point. Something is setting me off. Yeah. And so what That's we've had to learn route. is be comfortable with telling the other person when to stop and telling them when they need to take a break, even in the heat of that moment, mm -hmm. uh, which feels terrible at the time. And you do have to learn how to see that as they're trying to help you and then how to step away and process that and say, all right, when she's telling me to stop, like there's obviously something happening that I'm not seeing or I'm too deep in to be able to fix in that moment. And I need to step away. I need that that stop sign, that warning that says, Hey, we're taking this too far. This isn't the way we want to go, mm. you know, step away for a minute. And it's a hard thing to hear in the moment, especially when you're already, you know, keyed up on whatever's going on in front of you. Yeah, man. I, um, Oh, I'm, I, I'm butting in. I was, I was going to let Andrew go on. Um, but, uh, yeah, actually I'll, yeah, I'll kick it off to Andrew, man. Um, I, I mean, hearing that, I don't know if there's anything that like kind of sparks your your mind or, or kind of you, you relate to any of that? I mean, for me, I'm the other side of that coin, right? My my wife has, I would say, a shorter fuse with our children, our dogs, me, than I do. Or at least she doesn't have that, that kind of ability to just stop and be calm and take care of the thing that needs taken care of without emotion or, or 
or letting it aggravate her, right? Like, and I'm not saying it doesn't aggravate mm-hmm. me. It's just I have this weird ability to be like, okay, this is done. Now I'm going to go over there and scream, right? Um, and <laughs> so I, I'm i the one who always has to do the, hey, babe, calm down, right? And that never works, right? Mm-hmm. Like, those two words together are just the like lighting the fuse, <laughs> throwing it in a pile of gasoline and being like, okay, let's see how fast this blows up. But yeah, but yeah. there aren't good words for like even hey take a breath right just I don't t- I mean it's it's one of those when you're in that moment if you're not ready to step back how do you get your partner to take the step back right and I think for her she really struggles with how does it she struggles with if it feels like she's not doing her part. Right. Or she's not doing Mm. the best she could for our daughters when that's that's not the case. She's just having a bad day. Right. Like yesterday. Great example. She's having a terrible day at work. I make dinner and I did hamburgers. Right. She chose to eat her hamburger without a bun. Don't ask me why. And then she went and grabbed a knife from the knife block to cut her hamburger. And I just went don't use my paring knives on like a hamburger, like get a butter knife. We don't need to like dull. And, and that was it. That was the yeah. end of the conversation. I was in trouble. The world exploded. <laughs> right. And I'm a cook. I'm, I'm a, I'm an amateur chef, right? I have very expensive knives to run them across to porcelain plate is basically to just put a piece of sandpaper on them. Right. And so we have knives for that purpose. Anyway, it's an ongoing thing in our home. And it was just the moment that set her off, but it had nothing to do with the knife for her. It was all about the fact that her coworkers had all claimed bereavement because they're, um, sorry, this is getting off topic. It, yeah. 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 Her coworkers had all claimed bereavement. She was overworked yesterday. Right. And yeah, yeah. Hmm. there's a deeper root to the frustration. Right. Like what she was complaining about is just uh, like, it's a, it's an extension of right. something deeper. And so right? it yeah. was on me to acknowledge she wasn't pissed at me about the fact that I corrected her for the umpteenth time about what our knives are for. It was making sure she knew I wasn't really mad about the knife. And she she can be upset about work and it's not a problem, right? But it was an event and it has to be dealt mm-hmm. with. And you have to be able to, at some point, take a step back and look at it, like Ben said, and... and have that calmer voice. And sometimes you're the calmer person and sometimes you're not. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think Ben relays a lot of stories where he's the one who's being told to calm down. And I'm always relaying the stories where it's like, calm, let's all calm. Let's move to the next level. Right. Um, But (laughs) it's, it's funny because this exact thing came up on discord and Ben and I both replied with like paragraphs for this guy about, Hey, it, you just have to talk. You just, it doesn't matter what you say. You have to actually talk though. Silence isn't going to work. It's only going to make things worse. Eventually you will say the right thing. It's about opening that door for the conversation as well. So I think there's a lot of trust that goes into that. Like effective communication doesn't happen without trust. Um, And there's, there's a certain level of vulnerability that has to happen um, on all sides in order to give and receive that type of communication, uh, whether it's feedback from a spouse or just opening up about how you feel about a certain situation. Um, yeah. and, and that's, that's kind of where a lot of, I feel like marriages kind of fall flat is people hold things in and don't find an effective <laughs> and mature way to discuss them. And so it may not be in the moment. With each it other. May be the key there is with each other. Right, with each not other. Not with right, all with your with friends in the bar yeah. and the guys exactly. at work. It's with each right. other. <laughs> yeah, that is that is not the place to have the discussion, right? The discussion needs to happen with the person you're having the issue with or the, the miscommunication with. You know, I um, one thing that I've had to be more con- you know, conscious of, and not just in my marriage, but it also just kind of translates to just all aspects, especially with like kids and stuff, is – you know, picking and choosing your battles, which is something that we hear so often. But like, I heard one marriage therapist talk about like, you are like, you really need to think about whatever conversations or or situations that are brewing, like, are these roommate problems? Or are they real problems? Mm -hmm. Right? Like a roommate problem being just like small, and it's annoying, it's bugging you. But is it really something that needs to be like addressed to the point where it can, you know, like, blow something up? Or is this something that you can just kind of like, 
settle on your own and, and kind of move on. And, you know, especially with like little kids, you know, you really have to really have to like with toddlers really pick and choose your battles. Like are these little things like the, the little bits of chaos and the little bits of mess, like, sure, you, you, you got to teach them in, in these instances, but like, what's worth like having a real like battle or in a real teaching moment mm -hmm. versus what can just like, I'm gonna let that one go. Right. Uh, especially in marriage, that's really hard. Um, and I've had to like be much more conscious about that, whether that's like, like one thing that like just bugs the hell out of me. It's just my wife goes through like paper towels extremely <laughs> fast, like, like just like <laughs> everything, just like nonstop. I and mean, I'm like, it's costing us money. No, it's not. It's but it, and that's the thing, though, like in my head, I'm just like, why? Like we could just use rags instead of paper. Right. Right. But is that something that I really want to like bring up and and, and just mm -hmm. like, you know, I'll like. I'll I'll bring it up in like in casual, just like in a joke or whatever. But it's but like it's never gonna be something that it's like this is marriage defining. Like, what the hell is wrong with you, woman? You know, like of course not. You know, no. but some guys will let it get to that point. It'll, they'll let the the anger and the charge and then let it build up, and it just becomes this thing, right? Um, and if it does get to that point, it's like let then you need to like make just make that conscious effort to communicate that in an effective mature manner, like the way that, right. that Andrew just laid out. Right. And there are ways right. to do that rather than going zero to 100 really quick, because you just let this microaggression build up and build up and build up and build up. And now you're furious about it. Right. I think that happens all too often. Right. Well, uh, and it's that the, the issue at hand is not really the issue. The right. issue is not the paper towels. The right. issue is you're, you see, and this is, this happens a lot, right? The, yeah. the issue is not the way I load the dishwasher. The issue is not, uh, you know, not packing the kids lunches the way you think it should be packed. Right. The real issue is that either there's a, a, a lack of a split of duties or a lack of attention or right. a lack of communication around a specific topic. Right. Um, you know, the paper towel thing, it might be a lack of communication around finances, right? Like there's right. other things you're worried about and you're saying we need to save money. And every time you see that paper towel rip off, you're thinking, Oh, there's another, you know, two cents gone. There's another two cents gone. And it just sort of builds up and builds up. And where you can mitigate that in a healthy relationship is having that communication beforehand and saying, all right, we're going to sit down once a week, talk about budget and finances, what we have coming up. So we're not running into situations where we're like, oh man, we're, you know, the bank account's going to be short this month because we didn't pay attention to what we were spending. Mm -hmm. And I, are you guys, I mean, I, are you guys familiar with what what's called the invisible load? It's like this big topic in in, mm -hmm. in the mommy community in the world, right? Uh, but um, and I don't know that dads really acknowledge this too much, but just for the sake of having the conversation here, um, I think that is something that doesn't get acknowledged a lot, especially on, on guys, because like the, the most common like meme fight, you know, that we that we see is just kind of like you know, you don't help and, and do enough, you know, when, when a wife like talks to the husband, like, you don't do enough, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've been with the kids all day, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, I've been at work all day and I can't come home and just have a break. And there's always that fight. It's the, it's the universal fight that we all have. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, the topic of this, of this podcast, you know, talk about stats, right. When it comes to households where parents both are working outside of the home. These are raw stats. 61% of moms handle most of the household chores themselves. 61%, mm. right? We're not wow. picking up our weight. 50 per, 54% of moms manage their kids' schedules and activities, right? They're the ones doing the soccer. They're the ones planning dinners. They're the ones figuring all that out. 55% of moms take charge of caring for sick kids. We've, we, you know, we just went through that as well. 62% uh, of moms take less than one hour for themselves a day. So I, these are things where, and th these actually numbers are actually a little bit surprising. I feel like it'd be more lopsided. Guys are much more involved in, in families more than ever. Um, but, you know, obviously in an ideal world, it'd be 50 50, right? We all like, you know, we are all uh, all in this together. But I don't know, man. If I, I did 50% of the laundry, I'd be buying <laughs> new shirts all the time because I'd be <laughs> shrinking things left and right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing though every house like everyone does their thing like you know it's like i don't know like there's some things that i just i personally just don't touch in the house right like uh mm -hmm. I, I do my own do you guys do your own laundry just out of curiosity 
we split Who'd, laundry duties. Oh, uh, really? I'm yeah. bad at it. it, it it's, home, it's seasonal. Like, sometimes I'm doing more laundry. Sometimes she does more laundry. I do a lot of the cooking. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it really yeah. just, it's See, for me, it's, if I do the laundry, it's all done on one Saturday, and the whole house is like a pile of clean laundry. And then she's like, but, but now we have to fold it all. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's all done. It was done on a Saturday. <laughs> it's all clean. We can dirty it all week long. So, but she's more of an everyday but, laundry person. That, that this actually would be a cool episode to kind of cover off like you know what what are the you know weights and, and, and duties in which like you guys are involved like mm -hmm. what do you take care of versus what, what what she takes care of i do finances they do this i do like laundry they do cleaning like i'm i'm curious about that that would be a fun conversation but when it comes to the invisible there's like a lot that i think mm -hmm. moms have to shoulder we have to shoulder a lot as well but it's the inability to acknowledge and empathize with some of that and 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 that can oftentimes be the impetus of of arguments the root of a lot mm -hmm. of arguments of uh, of that uneven distribution of labor or what feels to be unfair or unacknowledged um i i, I kind of like yeah get, and a lot a lot of it from what i've read comes from uh the things that moms will think about and consider that we don't I think as, as fathers or dads, sometimes just as men in general, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think we think about as much. So things like, uh, like food preferences, like, uh, I think about my kids' food preferences, but I think a lot of dads don't, right? Like they just mm -hmm. go out and they're like, I'm going to feed my kid. And like, I'm not thinking four days ahead about what we're going to make for dinner based on what my kids will or won't eat like we just and, and that's just how our household operates right like we make dinner and they either have it or they don't like that's just the thing mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it, i think it's like preferences i know in our house like my wife manages the majority of the kids schedules like if she's scheduling and this is where that sort of real invisible load comes in right like she's scheduling kids doctor's appointments and dentist appointments and all of these things that kind of happen outside the house um, that I don't really think of or take care of. Um, and so one of the things we've, we've tried to change about that, we're still working on this. It's not something we do every week, but on, mm -hmm. um, Sunday nights, we try to sit down and say, okay, like, what do we have going on this week? So like, what's the schedule? What meals can we plan out? Like what things can we cook, um, over the weekend or during the week that will feed us for lunches during the week? Um, what sort of like financial and time obligations do we have coming up? So basically just setting down and having almost like a business meeting of like, what does the family need to do this week so that we can get all that mapped out so that there are no surprises and there, there's less of me going to her and saying, well, what do we have to do today? Like, what are we doing this weekend? What's the plan for this, this, or this, what are we doing for dinner tonight? So I know what to make. Like we just stick it in the calendar, have the conversation. It's all set up. And we can just kind of follow the list, which makes it a little bit, it makes the system run a little smoother, makes communication a little easier. So that's, you know, what you brought up is a really, really good tactic, a really good approach, right? Kind of those, those maybe, you know, I, I think some couples uh, I've seen re refer to as kind of like a, like a, a Sunday, like a, like a reset Check up or something like that. It's yeah. like a Sunday reset where every Sunday they would sit down, they would do that. They kind of, you know, whether it's like go through the finances, plan out the week, meal plan, do whatever. They just have a sit down, a pow off for an hour every Sunday and get ready for the weekend. That's kind of the way they reset. But I think this is also a good tactic when not just to kind of not on like a planning and maintenance level, but I think it's a really good tactic when it comes to um, sorting out sort of frustrations, right? If you guys are getting really frustrated and you're nitpicking before you kind of blow up and then all of a sudden you, well, you're doing this and I'm doing this and blah, blah, blah. And it, it kind of goes like this, maybe like acknowledge that like we are kind of getting to that level and have one of those check downs or those sit downs, those resets where you write out like bullet point write out like mm -hmm. what your frustration is. And I think as you write it out and I do this as an exercise, I'm going to go do this, hun. You go and do that and let's just talk about it. Just, we can't talk right now. We're just like, we're just not there yet. I don't want to like talk out of, you know, out of turn or say something I don't want to say. Right. Let's just write down what you're frustrated about with, with me. What am I doing wrong, hon? I'm going to do the same. And let's chat later tonight. Okay. You just bullet point it. Just like five, 10 bullet points, whatever. And I think oftentimes what you'll find is like you said, you'll start to discover like maybe it's actually not the bullet points that's, that's 
bothering me. It's actually something else. It's just one big bullet point as opposed to these five small ones, right? But anyway, you write these out, you get together, and then you have like a checkup, you know? And this is, this is I, I'm saying this and it's just kind of like, all right, but like, because in reality, it's really hard to kind of like open up, talk, communicate, and set expectations because that's ultimately what you mm -hmm. really want to do is, is be open to setting expectations and, and acknowledging like what the frustrations are. But I think that tactic, it can go a long way. It's something that I've heard on, um, uh, through these, follow a lot of Instagram <laughs> couples, uh, yeah. approach people, uh, that have, you know, kind of gone to the tact of, uh, tactic of writing before speaking. Um, and then, you know, and then having a more calm powwow with what gets jotted down on paper. Um, and then I know, the other thing that I did want to kind of highlight here is also acknowledging that like, things are going to change, right? Like who you married 10 years ago versus who your partner became when they had kids versus who that partner is now, like there are changes, there are ebbs and flows, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to acknowledge that like one person isn't just going to stay that one person forever. And I think like some people can cling on to that and it can right. be a source of frustration as well. That's a very hard thing for people to deal with. We used to have so much sex. You were so horny. Now you're not. What the hell happened? You know, like I think that's one thing, or just like yeah, you used to love yeah, this. Kids and got exhausted. Yeah. Exactly right. I mean, it's just they're just they are. It's surprising how much kids take out of you. As many yeah. as many books as you read and conversations you have, and people are like, "Oh, I'm so tired," and I have kids. Like, well, how tired could you really? Kids are exhausted, like mentally, especially mm -hmm. at certain ages. Like our son is three. He is so much fun, but he is so mentally like challenging because it's just you have to talk through so much stuff with him because he's curious and he's frustrated and he's like got big emotions and there's all these things happening and it's just like you have to bear the brunt of that and guide him in the right direction and it's it's a, more than a full-time job of trying to do all those things and then leaving enough time to like maybe sit down with a glass of wine with your wife at the end of the night and be like, okay, remember we're still a married couple and we're still in this together. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, well, Ben, you were actually just talking about this. Uh, Ben, you're going to, you're, you're, you got a well-deserved date night in the books on Friday, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. that, that's, those, these are important days. You got, you guys got to prioritize these date nights. I think that's a very strong part. Uh, it's a very healthy part of maintaining a strong marriage, but one like tip, uh, before we kind of close things out, I'll, I'll leave you guys with the final word here. Uh, but um, uh, do the deed before you actually go out, right? <laughs> because like, you know, yeah. get, getting getting Ooh. fun and frisky, it's a big part of date nights, right? But like the reality is like no – like that that spontaneity that used to be there I was like oh we're going to dinner maybe a little maybe a little show and then I'll give a little massage and sneak my way in uh oh there we go yeah. no, like I think that's that's how you end up with kids <laughs> yeah exactly right <laughs> not for me anymore snip snip baby yeah. uh no but like I think uh, what a lot of people are saying now is like just acknowledge like hey before the date gets started get it done have fun get frisky and then go ahead and eat dinner and get bloated because no one wants to be all gassy and tired after it's like you know because sometimes mm -hmm. especially like when you're you know 10 15 20 years in marriage like it's i don't know sex can kind of like sometimes be a chore at least not not for me for i feel like for guys it's so much for, <laughs> for a while it's like it is you know and acknowledging that like nowadays it can be a chore for some you know it's not as as spontan spontaneous and frequent and frisky as as before uh, i think as guys you know we do latch on to like back when you were my girlfriend we would be horn dogs you know like i i think of that you know um when we go on these date nights getting it done before i think is a <laughs> is a good is a good tactic That's a, that is That's, a great tip you know what's funny <laughs> about that is you're bringing up my statter fact which is Carnegie Mellon did a study where they took 90 uh, heterosexual couples for 90 days and they said half of them continue their normal sex lives. The other half, you have to increase the amount of sex twofold. So if you're normally three nights a week, it's six nights a week. If you're two nights a week, four, right? It turns out that mm -hmm. the more sex you have, the less happy you're going to be. It's all about quality, not <laughs> quantity. Uh, hey. So... <laughs> That's the fact. Carnegie Mellon did the research. <clears throat> Make sure it's good, not just often.
Well, I'd be really interested to sure. know, like, if it's part, if you know it's part of a study and they know it's like, oh, we have to do this right. to be in the study, it becomes a job. I, and there's like, well, duh, like, I'm just so, not really in the mood, but like, we got to um, do it six okay. times a week. So there was a <laughs> woman in the Salt Lake City area who did a an article for, it was either the local paper or a blog thing, but I can find it. She and her husband had sex every day for a year and she said there were points where it got to this is a chore right now pending mm-hmm. medical issues yeah. or illnesses right but but she said by the end of it they actually had a lot more fun because at, they worked through the like point where I find this attractive on you. I find that attractive. And so by the end of the year, they both thought the nape of Mm. her neck was the most attractive feature she had when at the beginning of the year, he could have cared less about the nape of her neck. Right. But that turned her on. And so by the end of a year of her being like the nape of the neck, man, it, it turned into an erogenous (laughs) zone for him on her. Right. And so I think it goes both ways. Right. And I think that's what the Carnegie Mellon thing is getting to. It's about, quality Mm -hmm. not quantity right and they just had to do the longitudinal piece of nope we're going to do it every night to get through the bad to figure out what the good is (laughs) anyway well uh, it's it's an interesting article it was a pretty fun read I think uh, I think we've had a really good conversation. I feel like you know a quick thirty minute episode uh, does not do this topic justice. Is probably something we probably want to revisit and have maybe have a couple more voices on here. Uh, But before we sign off, we just quickly want to get to one of our discord comments. We always like to do this uh, at some point in our, in our, uh, one of our episodes. And just like yesterday, we had D boy HHX one, Sam, what's up, Sam. Uh, He commented, my son's been teething. So nights have ranged from good to terrible, depending on the night. Last night, he decided to be awake for, uh, for one hour at 3 a.m. He blew bubbles, made farting noises the whole time. I fed him, rocked him, did everything I could to try. Uh, I could, I think of to try uh, to get him back to sleep after an hour passed. I was ready to give up. Of course, one thing that I didn't check. Turns out he had majorly pooped his pants. Uh, he was trying to tell me this the whole time, but I was too tired to notice or smell. Poor guy was sleeping in his own shiz whole time. And here I was trying to force him to sleep. Poor guy. What a night, guys. I mean, who hasn't been yeah. there, though? I mean, yeah, I mean, times where I just haven't even smelled it. And I just like, oh, this is why this whole time, because like, I just don't want to go down there sometimes. You know, I'm sure you guys have been there. Yep. This is more of a, yeah, this is more of a nothing to say, but we feel you. We've been there. I Stay strong. You, yeah. I've been there. Yeah. Don't feel dumb or out of place because we've done that. I've done that too many times. I'm sorry. This is. This, this too shall pass. Those early months are just an absolute grind. Uh, but, you know, this is a phase. It's just one of those phases. Um, and, you know, it's uh, it's just it's just part of it. Paying your dues. We make mistakes. And there you have it. Guys, that'll do it for this week's episode of the Ever Podcast. Uh, go ahead and check the links in the show notes or the YouTube description to join us on Discord if you want to potentially be featured in one of those little segments right there. And also visit dadverb.com for courses from pregnancy up through year one of fatherhood. As always, thanks for listening. Catch you in the next one. Peace.